Good morning. Welcome to Union Congregational Church. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. It is a day where we have a lot going on as a country, as a congregation. We are, as I don't even need to say, just a, a few short days away from Election Day, the eve of a presidential election, which has many of us feeling perhaps a mix of hopeful, anxious, fatigued, uh, dread, any of that we bring before God this morning. And we are also celebrating All Saints Day. Although, as a Protestant denomination, we don't formally recognize saints in the canonized sense of the word, we do lift up various saints in our own lives who have formed our faith in some way and who have passed from this life. And so on Remembrance or All Saints Sunday, we celebrate and honor and remember those forebearers in faith. Today, we will read aloud the names of the saints in our own community who have passed in the last year. We pray that their memories will continue to be a beacon of faith, hope, and love for all of us. And so in the presence of all of this, we will celebrate communion together, breaking bread around God's table where all are welcome and where we find nourishment for life's journey. So if you are online and have not yet grabbed a, a piece of bread and juice or whatever it is to represent communion for you this morning, I invite you to do that now. Children will be with us this morning. We are glad to welcome them in communion as well. And then after communion, we'll go together today for a joint Sunday school class with Grace Presbyterian Church. So we will give you instructions on that when the time comes. So friends, let us worship God together, rising in body or spirit and joining together in our call to worship. Sometimes worship is a parade, a celebration, a gathering of people expressing their joy. Sometimes worship is an adventure, a quest, a gathering of people searching for meaning. Sometimes worship is a funeral, a fast, a gathering of people seeking comfort in their grief. Among us today are people who have come to march, people who have come to search, people who have come to weep. Yet we have all come to acknowledge God and to touch each other. So come with open minds, open hearts, and open arms, that we all might find that for which we have come, and that as well we might be surprised. Let us join together in singing, I sing a song of the saints of God. When we remember the saints, we do so often with rose-colored glasses. 
We watch the highlight reels of their lives in our mind's eye, leaving their missteps and mistakes on the cutting room floor. We want to hold on to the very best of them, but in doing so, we sometimes forget the complexities that made them human, that make us human. God wants every part of us, not just the highlight reel. So let us come before God with honesty and authenticity as we pray. Holy God, we want to make you proud. We want to hide away our faults so no one can see. We want to be considered worthy of sainthood. But you know our faults anyway. You know every detail of our lives. Forgive us for trying to pretend we're perfect. Holy God, we confess that we dance along the line between self-improvement and vanity. We read self-help books, listen to sages who tell us how we can achieve perfection, and try to eliminate all the mess from our lives so we can feel in control. Forgive us for striving to be godlike when all you've ever asked of us is to be human. Holy God, we forget that even the saints are human. Even the saints are messy and complicated. Our heroes are flawed. Our loved ones make mistakes. And our idols aren't really made of solid gold. We confess that we are quick to judge the faults of others we have placed on a pedestal as though they aren't human too. Forgive us for expecting too much of one another. Forgive us, we pray. Give us grace to trade the illusion of perfection for the real life you have gifted us, and hold us secure in the promise of future glory. Amen. Family of faith, hear the good news. You do not have to be perfect to be a saint. You just have to be the person God created you to be. God's grace is abundant and it is for you. There is nothing that can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Thanks be to God for a love like that. Amen. So let us greet one another as renewed and forgiven people with a word in the chat if you are joining us online or a greeting to your neighbor here in the pews. May the peace of Christ be with you all. can greet one another for just a moment longer as we're preparing our, uh, <laughs> our ritual participants. Thank you. So on All Saints Day, we take time to remember and honor those who have gone before us. While they were with us, we saw them face to face. Their voice, their touch, their smile. And now, beyond the veil that separates this world and the next, all we see is the glow of their Christ light, flickering as part of the great cloud of witnesses. And so in this part of the service, we read aloud the names of those from our congregation or those who we held memorial services for this past year. And we will pause as we read each name to light a candle to represent them. So we remember Shirley Lovejoy,
Nancy Blevin. Robert Upton. Robin Lobsitz. The Reverend Cynthia Reynolds. Cliff Lindholm II. The Reverend Bob Castles. Marilyn Yoiter. The Reverend York Peeler. Liz Kaplan. Kate Ketchatorian. And we light this last candle in remembrance of all of those other saints that we have lost. So I invite you to name aloud or in your heart any other saint that you have lost in this last year. Sue, Renee. Though we don't see them face to face any longer, these saints are not gone. Their memory lives on in us as their soul lives on with the Creator. Their Christ light shines just as brightly now as it did before, unbound by the physical limitations of their earthly bodies. They are now part of the glory that awaits beyond this life. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, in whom we live and move and have our being, we entrust these souls to you. As you formed them from the earth, we have returned their bodies to the earth. And as you breathed your breath of life into them, their souls have returned to you, source of all. Hold them close and hold us close too. Give us your peace as we await the day we return to you in glory, in life, in death, and in life after death. We trust in you, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Amen. The saints have gathered around this table week after week for thousands of years because this simple meal of bread and wine brings us together as only our holy parent can, across space and time, one family of faith, existing in the eternity of God's grace. This meal is for you. Whether this is your first time or your thousandth, you are welcome at this table because it is Christ himself who invites us. So come to the family meal. The saints are saving you a seat. Let us pray. Holy Creator, you fashioned us with a heart like yours, expansive and made to love deeply. We hold so many people in our hearts this day, those who have passed and those left behind, those who have laid a foundation for our faith, and those who will build on the foundation we have laid, those who are grieving the loss of a loved one and those who are celebrating new life entering this world. And so we pause for a moment to name aloud the joys and the sorrows on our hearts to you, O oh God. And so friends, I invite you this morning to name aloud or in your heart, any prayer you bring will be a, a great cacophony of prayer rather than our usual one at a time repeated for all. So lift up your joys and concerns before God. We celebrate Annalisa and Tyler as they run the New York City Marathon. We pray for all those who are grieving. God hears the prayers of our mouths and of our hearts. 
God, in your wisdom beyond our understanding, you have placed a veil around this life. We don't know what was before. We don't know what's after. All we know is the passing from one to the next and the holy in-between in which we live our days. Our lives are only a brief glimmer in your eternal glory, one flickering candle with a borrowed flame. So we pray that you would keep our flames strong. Give us a fire that burns for justice, warms cold hearts, and comforts those living in an endless night. Let our brief flames ignite and inspire others, passing on what we have received from the saints you have placed in our lives. And as our lights dim, grant us the peace of rest in your holy darkness and your eternal glory. May we then come to fully understand the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Amen. Paul tells the Corinthians, For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that on the night the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and said, This is my body that is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Friends, this is God's table where all are welcome. We have gluten-free bread and grape juice, in a moment, we will invite first the choir, and then you will be uh, guided forward by the ushers. If you wish to remain in your seats, the ushers will let us know and we will come serve you afterward. Come, for all things are ready. this bread, drink this cup, come to me and never be hungry. Eat this bread, drink this cup, trust in me and you will not thirst. I am the bread
Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you for this meal that unites us with saints across the span of time. We are hungry for your presence, your love, and your justice. May the meal we shared offer us sustenance for the journey ahead. Amen. At this time, I'd like to invite any kids who would like to go to Sunday school to follow Dan. They're going to go out this side door today over to meet up with the kids from Grace Presbyterian Church, and they will come back and meet uh, grown-ups in the assembly room for coffee hour. So have fun together.
Our first reading today comes from the Gospel according to Mark. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, he asked him, which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, the first is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and beside him there is no other. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself, this is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask him any question. And from Paul's letter to the Romans, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its enslavement to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning together as it suffers together the pains of labor, and not only the creation, but ourselves, who have the first, first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what one already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with groanings too deep for words. And God, who searches hearts, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Here ends the readings. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? O oh, love that will not let me go, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts do justice to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Are we there yet? Gosh, when I think of my poor parents, and the number of times my brother and I must have whined that phrase along the many long car drives of my childhood. And we didn't have screens or tablets to distract us or offer my parents a moment of reprieve. Those trips were often full of excitement on our way to vacation or Christmas break to visit grandparents or cousins. And so our eagerness to be out of the car was equal parts excitement and anticipation mixed with the boredom of the back seat. And now, I somehow am the one in the driver's seat. And I marvel at my parents' patience. Car rides continue for me to be a portal to both the past and the future. Every time I am overcome with nostalgia for those childhood trips and incredulity that now I'm actually the driver and those wines are coming from my very own children. How could that be? Wistfulness for time passing, mixed with a bit of lament for how it might be different, if only slightly, if I were more patient if there was but more time to enjoy it all. If I could somehow pry my children from their screens and make them appreciate looking out the window. I mean, isn't it beautiful? Look at the leaves. In our scriptures today, we hear two different, 
but not contradictory answers to the question of, are we there yet? In Romans, Paul's poetry speaks of Earth's groaning, of creation's constant labor pains, the not yet of God's kingdom. And in Mark's gospel, Jesus affirms the scribes' interpretation of the law and the prophets as the call to love God and love one's neighbor, as not far from the kingdom. These two passages together suggest that there is a not yet, but not far quality of life on earth, a constant yearning for God's reign, which is always just beyond us. On All Saints Day, we find ourselves in a similar posture, looking back at those with whom we have traveled along life's journey, reckoning with time's passage and the realities of the present moment, with perhaps a tinge of if only or what if, for how life might be different or better if the saints of our lives were still living or if somehow we could take the lessons of their lives and apply them a little differently. We wonder how time flies and still long for a future where all past tensions or shortcomings are resolved, a sweet future without any lingering bitterness. And we look at the newspaper or our calendars that tell us we are two short days away from election day. In an election year and era in our country in which polarization, division, and even violence are commonplace. How can it be that 2,000 years after Christ, we still seem to be so far from the kingdom? Aren't we there yet? I think she gets it, yeah. I know most of us can't wait to put election day behind us and move on from the anxiety and noise of this season. And many are equally anxious about what might lie ahead of us. Perhaps some of you are hopeful. And it is that mix of hope and anxiety that I want to linger with this morning. What is it we are hoping for or anxious about? What can an election bring about that may or may not move us closer to or farther from the reign of God? In this month's Christian Century magazine, the writer James K.A. Smith shared wisdom from the 5th century African theologian Augustine of Hippo that might offer us some insight and perspective for the days and weeks ahead. He writes that at the heart of Augustine's political wisdom is an awareness of what time it is. Late in Augustine's life, he counseled Boniface, a Roman general governing the precinct of Africa. And in a letter from 418, Augustine addresses Boniface's frustrations with the uprisings and incursions by those who despised the Christian faith. Boniface thinks he knows what the kingdom of God is supposed to look like. And he's tempted to impose it, to make the kingdom come. Augustine cautions the impatient ruler. We ought not to want to live ahead of time with only the saints and the righteous. Living ahead of time means imagining we can achieve some ideal embodiment of justice, whether it's utopia or the kingdom, by imposing our will. Politics, Augustine counsels, demands patience. Politics is the art of forging a life together in the now. The institutions of our republic and the practices of democracy are eroded precisely when we imagine that we can live ahead of time. For Augustine, we cannot answer the question of what should we do unless we first answer the question, when are we? And Augustine offers three concepts to help us forge a common life in this long meantime of our existence. The first concept is Augustine's notion of the saculum. 
Unlike our common use of the word secular, which often is referred to as a space, like the secular public square, for Augustine, the saculum is an era, a chunk of history. That divine eruption in history that is the story of our faith, the incarnation, the cross, the resurrection and ascension, becomes the Greenwich Mean Time of all history. In its shadow is the time in which we find ourselves, the saculum, this age in between the cross and the kingdom come. Our time is the parentheses between God's incarnation in history and the eventual eternal reign of God. Why does this make a difference for our politics? Because to see the time of our, pen, of our political endeavors as the saculum shapes our political expectations. For Augustine, it means that we should expect pluralism. We shouldn't be shocked or scandalized by deep disagreement in the common wheel. While God's spirit has been unleashed in history and in the church, the kingdom is not here yet. And so politics is the hard work of forging a life in common, despite the fact that we, as fellow citizens, might be animated by fundamentally different versions and visions of the good. This council challenges us to look inward. It's tempting to point fingers at others, at candidates, at parties, at individuals who we feel are trying to impose their political will on us but examining our own impatience, my own impatience, helps us focus on how to forge a life together now. And it points us right back to Jesus's teaching to love God and to love our neighbors. It shows us that no ruler, no elected leader can themselves bring about even our most desired change alone, but rather it will take relationship building and the slow, steady work of forging common values and community. The notion of the saculum is related to the second concept that Augustine provides, the idea of the earthly and heavenly cities. His writing, The City of God, is really a tale of two cities, which he describes as the earthly city and the heavenly city, or the city of man and the city of God. And the two cities are not distinguished by realm or jurisdiction as if the earthly city were material and the heavenly city spiritual, but rather by they're distinguished by two different loves. The earthly city revolves around love of self and the lust for power and domination. And the city of God revolves around love of God and engenders sacrifice for the neighbor. And because he is so deeply aware that we live in the saculum, Augustine doesn't want the city of God to colonize the earthly city. He argues against theocracy, including ideas that we would translate in our time to Christian nationalism. Instead, he points us to a third concept, recognition that we live in the permixtum of these two cities. Permixtum means mixed, mingled, combined we find ourselves thrown into shared territories that are occupied by citizens of both cities who need to figure out how to live together. The saculum is a long season of mixing with neighbors who share very different visions of the common good. Ours is the time of wheat and tares, sheep and goats, deep differences lived out in close proximity. So to recap those three concepts, we are in the saculum, the in-between time in which God's reign is not yet. And there is tension between the earthly city and the heavenly city, but we find ourselves firmly in the permixtum. There is no either or, so how do we live in this in-between? Augustine counsels a kind of holy impatience on the one hand, we pray and labor for a world that looks more like the just, flourishing kingdom that we long for. 
This waiting is not the same as what Martin Luther King Jr. called the tranquilizing drug of gradualism, using waiting as a code for enshrining the status quo. But on the other hand, even a properly prophetic desire and hunger must avoid the hubris of thinking that we could socially engineer our way out of the world's brokenness by sheer ingenuity or force. Tuesday's election is important. It's meaningful. And we should be invested in participating and in what its outcome means, especially for our more vulnerable neighbors. But on Wednesday, or whatever day we get the results, regardless of the outcome, we will still be in the saculum permixtum. Our work will still be to love God and love neighbor. Creation will still groan with longing for a world without unnecessary suffering. And as followers of Christ, we will still be called to share our hope, our holy impatience, and our love with all those who need it. As we remember all those who have come before us, we are reminded that the work of kingdom building is long, and we are the inheritors of its historic and holy lineage. Are we there yet? Not yet, but we're getting there. May it be so. Amen.
So November also begins our stewardship or generosity season in the church. You will be receiving in the mail likely later this week a letter from our generosity team and an invitation to consider prayerfully discerning your pledge for the upcoming year. So to begin this season, we have invited Janet Valdez de Pena to share a personal reflection of what uh, stewardship uh, and abundant life in this congregation means to her. Oh, love. Or why I give. We moved here in 1994, and I was a relatively new mother whose career on Broadway had seemed to come to a screeching halt, and I've lost my community. But my neighbor knocked on my door, Bob Waite, and he said, I hear you're an actor. You know, we have a theater group at, at Union Kong. You should join us. So I did, and I found that the loneliness, the devastating loneliness before the internet huh, was relieved by you. So the reason that I give is you. You got me through putting my kids through school. You got me through empty nesting when I thought I was completely alone. You know, we've been through a lot together. You know what? I'm a musical theater person, so I just have to sing it, okay? Put up with me. But I think you'll understand what I mean. I've made it through Dave Shaw and Stephanie Weiner. That was great stew in the pot. When you've been through Dave Shaw and Stephanie Weiner, you've been through a lot. Good times and bum times, you helped through all. So I give, I still give. Funerals and weddings, baptism, confirmants too. I still give. You taught my kids stories, old and new. Side door and scouts, marches too. Survive 2020 on Zoom with you. So I give. Lord knows, thank God there was you. So I give. I still give. I still Offering now be received.
Holy God, you knit us together, threading our lives to the generations before us and the generations after us. May these gifts be used to continue the work our ancestors began and to build on what we are doing now. So into your hands we entrust these gifts so that our unfinished work might one day be complete. Amen. You may be seated. Just a few announcements as we come to the close of our service. And Roxanne, you can come on up as you prepare for yours. Tomorrow night, the Central Atlantic Conference, the regional body of which we are part of as a church, will host an online Election Eve prayer vigil at 6 p.m. on Zoom. I will be one of several clergy from across the conference that will be taking part in that, so I invite you to join us. Next, uh, next Sunday, we will have the Reverend Ann Roloski, one of the co-ministers of First Congregational Church Montclair, as our guest preacher. And this afternoon at 3 o'clock, the youth group is invited to serve at Tony's Kitchen as part of their first Sunday of the month service. And lastly, there was a ring found in one of the pews. It is a small, if I can find it, I'll hold it up, a small silver ring. If you lost it last week, please come see me, and we'd like to return it to its owner. So go ahead, Roxanne, I'll turn it to you. Greetings, everybody. I am so pleased and excited and honored to invite all of you to a performance this coming Saturday right in our assembly room at 7 p.m. for an original reading of a play by Taya Artistry, the same team which, as uh, you've seen their work in the past, through Uniform Justice. Now, this play was performed in New York, and it is wonderful to be able to tell you that it got rave reviews from newspapers and theater critics, one of which especially comes to my mind now at, of all times. One writer from the New York Amsterdam News said of this play, you see a lot of shows and this one marinates and stays in my heart, my mind, and my soul. Being Shaka has done that for me. Now, Bob Chase, who, as you know, was the founder of Intersections International, he was the one who, what, under his auspices, Taya was founded. And it is the dream of this group to continue to produce original work which heals and invites people to see things through a different perspective, to consider and use insight and use curiosity. And as Katrina so elo eloquently put it in her talk, boy, do we need to use all of our insight to understand and come to each other and embrace each other now. So please come this Saturday, invite your friends. I promise you, you will have a meaningful experience that will continue to marinate. Thank you. We invite you to join us as you are able in the singing of our closing hymn number 588.
service, we invite you to stay for coffee hour in the assembly room and where you will uh, be um, partisan to a special tr uh, musical tribute. We will leave you guessing what that means. So friends, may you, as you leave this place, know that you are not alone. You are surrounded by the company of saints, held by the God who made you and led by the spirit who binds us together in this not yet, but getting there time that we live in. Go in peace. Amen. Thank you.